Yet another out-of-touch Hollywood news outlet is crying toxic fandom to blame fans for sh content, so you know we have to talk about this, right? <clears throat> Hi y'all, SnarkyJ Cosplay here. I just found an article by Variety, and being that we've spoken so much about the supposed toxicity of fandom culture these days, I thought this has to be spoken about. I can't just ignore it. So it's an article on Variety titled, Toxic Fandom, How Hollywood is Battling Fans Who Are Just Out For Blood. From social media boot camps to super fan focus groups. Now that's a mouthful and a half. So based on the title alone, I had so many thoughts, but I thought, you know what? Let's take it piece by piece and really analyze what the hell these people are going on about, right? But first, a word from this video's sponsor. We're officially in spooky season, but you know what doesn't have to be scary? Finding ways to save money. The free Upside app gets you cash back on everyday stuff like gas, groceries, and dining. With over 100,000 gas stations, convenience stores, and restaurants on the app, earning real cash back is easy and convenient. I spend a lot of time during the week working on my content, so I don't have time to sit and prepare a meal, and that's where earning cash back on takeout really helps me out. And before you ask, yes, it's real cash back. It's not points or credits you're never gonna use in some complicated reward system. The Upside app lets you earn real cash that you can put right back into your bank account. Frequent Upside users earn an average of $340 a year. To find out how much you could earn, click the link in the description to download the free Upside app and use my promo code SNARKYJ to get an extra 25 cents back per gallon on your first tank of gas. After that, claim an offer on Upside, pay as you normally would, and follow the steps in the app to get paid. It's that easy. Upside is putting $1 million cash back into the pockets of its users every week. You can earn three times more cash back with Upside than with any other product, including credit card rewards. Top upside earners are making as much as $300 a month. To find out how much you could earn, click the link in the description to download the Upside app or scan the QR code on screen and use my promo code SNARKYJ to get an extra 25 cents back per gallon on your first tank of gas. Download the Upside app and start earning cash back on your gas, grocery, and dining purchases today. The article begins, On August 28th, Amanda Stenberg, the lead of the Star Wars series The Acolyte, posted an eight and a half minute video to her Instagram stories about Lucasfilm's abrupt decision not to pick up the show for a second season just a month after the season one finale streamed on Disney+. It's not a huge shock for me, Stenberg said. Since the series was announced in 2020, she continued, We started experiencing a rampage of, I would say, hyper conservative bigotry and vitriol, prejudice, hatred, and hateful language towards us. I remember that very vividly. I did a video about that on this channel, and I thought it was fascinating that she not only called it conservative hate, what this article also conveniently left out is that she also claimed that the bigotry, vitriol, hatred, prejudice, all the buzzwords she used, were also from people mainly focused on the alt-right. So she essentially tried to label a group of people who just didn't like a Star Wars show with the label of extremism, which makes zero sense and is really cruelly generalizing, which you would think we would try to avoid in 2024, right? Not to mention the fact that the Acolyte's streaming numbers got progressively worse to the point that they were eventually terrible by the end of the series, and the show supposedly cost anywhere from $180 million to around $230 million. Every minute that this show was on cost over a half million dollars, which is absolutely f insane. Of course, with failure numbers like that, it was canceled just a month after the finale. Honestly, this should surprise no one. In other words, the Acolyte was the latest high-profile target of toxic fandom, the catch-all term for when fan criticism curdles from good faith dissatisfaction into a relentlessly negative, often bigoted online campaign against either the project or its stars or creative leaders. In a franchise economy, increasingly dependent upon established 
established audience devotion to drive the bottom line, the threat of toxic fandoms poisoning that enthusiasm has become a seemingly intractable headache for almost every studio. And it's only getting worse. In which they're still ignoring the fact that the bottom line and the big issue with the Acolyte was that the show was not good. It was not viewed by enough people. People that started it stopped watching that is evident in the streaming numbers. It did not have the viewership to justify 180 to 230 million dollars spent on a show that so few people liked. Not to mention that if Disney was so hell-bent on defending that show, then they probably shouldn't have also ripped all the merch for the Acolyte off their sites, but they did so because they realized that they spent a ton of money on a dog. It failed, it flopped, and not because of racism or misogyny or it failed because it's a bad f***ing show. A franchise economy increasingly dependent upon established audience devotion. You mean the fact that we live in a society where people no longer create new ideas and generate new IPs, instead they keep going back to essentially beat a dead horse. They know that these established IPs hold weight for people and people love them, so instead of trying to, I don't know, create something new, they go back and rehash these other things and then remake them for a modern audience that doesn't exist. So they essentially want to have their cake and eat it too because not only do they want to take control control of your IPs and slap the labels on just about anything that they make so that you'll pay for it, but they also don't want to make a product that you enjoy. People are just out for blood regardless. Yeah, when content is well made, can we say the same? Actually, I have a really good example for this. Can we talk about Fallout for a second? Because the Fallout franchise has actually been huge for years. It is beloved by so many people, and if you want to put it that way, it's probably most beloved by a really large male audience. And yet, when they released the Fallout show, which stars a female character, it is a woman-led show, nobody came out with any Anything misogynistic to say, the show was incredibly well rated, viewed by millions, and it did incredibly well because it was a great story and because the story itself and everything that happened within that series felt incredibly devoted to building the world built in the Fallout video game franchise. That show was raved about by both devoted fans of the video games and casual viewers. People can be out for blood, and oftentimes they are out for blood, but typically they are only out for blood when the content sucks, and that is when you people, the Hollywood elite, the marketing executives, the producers, the directors, the head honchos wiping their tears of toxic fandom with billions of dollars, that's when you turn around and cry toxic fandom because the content sucks and you happen to be using women and minorities and other diverse individuals as shields to defend your own garbage. You make a piece of content that you don't really think is gonna do well, but you've already had so many hands involved in writing this, you've already had to pay a lot of people in pre-pro, and so what do you do? Now in the casting, you start casting people that would be considered diverse, so that then when the vitriol for the content itself not being quality comes in, well you can blame it on, hey, it was the conservatives and the racists. That's why this went poorly. And you essentially make these people the scapegoats of your own shitty writing and poor production value. Sometimes toxic fandoms behave reactively. A House of the Dragon episode featuring two female characters kissing and an episode of The Last of Us focusing on a gay couple were both review bombed. The practice of mobbing sites like Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb with negative user reviews, which gained mainstream attention following the premiere of 2017's Star Wars The Last Jedi. Hmm. And an entire YouTube ecosystem is devoted to declaring projects like The Marvels and The Boys woke garbage. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order here and bring in an example that they brought in at the end of this article because I feel like both of these points tie in with each other. In some particularly egregious cases, a direct response has been necessary. In 2022, after Obi-Wan Kenobi actor Moses Ingram denounced the hundreds of racist messages sent to her about her role, there's nothing anybody can do about this. There's nothing anybody can do to stop this hate, she said. Lucasfilm posted a statement to its Star Wars social media account accounts that read, in part, there are more than 20 million sentient species in the Star Wars galaxy. 
don't choose to be a racist. The Star Wars accounts also shared a video of Obi-Wan star Ewan McGregor saying the abuse made him sick to his stomach and that if you're sending her bullying messages, you're no Star Wars fan in his mind. I won't argue that there aren't people out there that label anything starring a woman or a minority or a diverse cast woke without even watching the series and for that reason will denounce it. I won't argue that because it would be bullsh** on my part to sit here and say that that doesn't happen. Now, I personally don't actually watch this type of stuff on YouTube. I'm not actually a big YouTube viewer to begin with. Pretty much everything that I saw personally with my own eyes in regards to Kenobi was about the quality of the show, the time spent focusing on the Reva storyline versus Kenobi, the dialogue, the pacing. I did not personally see these racist remarks myself. I'm not saying they didn't happen. And if they did, it's unacceptable. There should be no place for people to speak this way. You should be able to star in a series and not be called some racial slur or deal with hate messages. I don't deny that there are people out there that behave like this. I've gotten plenty of racist and unappealing comments and messages. I've cosplayed Wonder Woman to countless charity events and have gotten comments like, great, the Mexicans are stealing our superheroes. I'm not Mexican and that is an incredibly racist thing to say. So I can't say that toxicity in a fandom doesn't exist because toxicity exists everywhere. That is the way of how things work. There's always rotten apples in the bunch. That's just how life works. But it's interesting how articles like these cherry pick the different things that they want to talk about and are completely unwilling to accept or highlight any valid criticism. They'll talk about review bombing. However, it's fascinating that they highlight 2017's The Last Jedi as an example of something that got review bombed because The Last Jedi is a genuinely terrible movie. The Force Awakens also starred Daisy Ridley as Rey, and The Force Awakens didn't get review bombed. In fact, a lot of people had positive opinions about The Force Awakens at first because it was the start of the new trilogy and people were still excited about it. It was only after TLJ that people realized this was going to hell in a handbasket, and so they weren't review bombing it, they were giving their opinions on a movie that sucked and that was already beginning the incredible tarnishing of the legacy of Star Wars that we've seen take place over the last, I don't know, 12 years since Disney purchased it. It's incredible how easy it is to cry review bombing, to cry racism, to cry misogyny, homophobia, any other thing without first acknowledging or taking a look into some of these criticisms. Just because there's an incredibly small number of people that can and will be toxic does not mean that you can invalidate any piece of criticism ever as hatred, bigotry, whatever buzzwords it is that these Hollywood elites and actors and actresses like to use. That is 90% not the case. Perhaps the greatest irony of this phenomenon is the disproportionate impact these toxic fandoms have relative to their actual number. The vast majority of any fandom are casual fans, says John Van Kitters, VP of Star Trek brand development, who has been with the storied franchise since the 1990s. The number of people who live and die on their franchises are very, very few, and then those who come after things that they espouse to love with Venom are a really, really tiny subset of that already smaller subset of fandom. It's just much easier to see it now. I don't know that it's really that much broader than where things were in 1995. It's just that the bullhorn wasn't there. Okay, so right there they've already acknowledged that the super, super toxic people, the really racist ones, the awful ones, are a very, very tiny portion. Okay, and then they're claiming that casual fans make up the majority. I will say, right, that Marvel movies, for instance, which make billions, don't make billions because they have a bunch of really Marvel obsessed people going and spending the money. They make billions because they appeal to a wide audience. However, when you look at something like Star Wars, right? If the audience is so casual and the majority of the audience aren't these really impassioned fans who are gonna be mad about lore and canon breaking and all that, why didn't the Acolyte get more views? Where's the money? right? Where is the money? Where are the views? Where are all the casual fans that supposedly are willing to buy into garbage? And why are shareholders panicking, right? 
If the money's still there, why is everybody freaking out? I think what's actually happening is that corporations like Disney are actually making content right now for a small yet vocal minority who will fawn over any poorly written, poorly produced, lackluster, uncreative content purely because it can be boasted and sold as diverse. And the fact of the matter is that the majority of the population just wants a good story and they're not willing to pay for or watch content that does not satisfy the need to be mentally engaged with content that isn't garbage. And then when that majority says, look, this is crap. I don't want to pay for Disney Plus anymore. I'm not going to buy tickets to this movie. I'm not going to take my kids to the theme parks. Then Disney and other corporations, they panic and they find those niche little hating groups that do exist but are very, very small and they latch on to that and they claim this is what all of you look like. All of you are flying under the black banner of cruelty, homophobia, racism, bigotry, prejudice, all sorts of things. You are all preaching this and they lash out and villainize the people that line their pockets. Borderlands failed pretty big this year, but nobody cried toxic fandom when that lost money. The Crow reboot failed pretty big this year, but nobody cried toxic fandom when that lost money. And the Joker 2 is currently getting destroyed online, and nobody's crying toxic fandom about that. So how about we stop blaming minorities for existing and claiming, oh my god, that's why this does badly. Every time we cast a minority, it all goes to shit. How about you just recognize that every time you write garbage, things go to shit. For some, combating that bullhorn amounts to acting as if they can't hear it. Particularly when it's a negative, toxic conversation, we don't even engage, says a TV marketing executive. Like with toxic people, you try to not give it too much oxygen. One's principal concern is that reacting to these kinds of attacks risks alienating fans who are unhappy with creative choices about a franchise but haven't tipped over into abusive behavior. So a studio may attempt to amplify friendlier voices instead. We'll reply to comments that are positive and elevate those things says the TV exec. Smart! Not engaging with toxicity is a good thing. So you should tell your actors, directors, producers, and everybody involved in a series, especially those whose faces make it to the big screen, that calling people members of the alt-right, blaming everything on conservatives, telling people that they are toxic and racist and misogynist and all that stuff, coming out and attacking the fans as a whole is not the way to do it. That's not amplifying friendlier voices. That is actually coming out and attacking the voices you disagree with under an incredibly damaging generalization. When you blame everything on racism and misogyny and all kinds of other prejudices and you ignore real criticism, well you let these people know we don't give a sh about your opinions and in fact the people that are just going to consume content, those are the important ones. You can shut the f up. And that leaves a really bad taste in the mouths of anybody who just wants to have their opinion be heard. Those who did talk with Variety all agreed that the best defense is to avoid provoking fandoms in the first place. In addition to standard focus group testing, studios will assemble a specialized cluster of superfans to assess possible marketing materials for a major franchise project. They're very vocal, says the studio exec. They will just tell us, if you do that, fans are going to retaliate. These groups have even led studios to alter the projects. If it's early enough and the movie isn't finished yet, we can make those kinds of changes. Bingo! That's it! That's it! I don't know why Variety is acting like, oh my god, they decided to listen to the fans, this is f***ing crazy. That's what they should have been doing from the beginning. You look at how YouTube and Instagram and Twitter and social media as a whole works, and it's the best form of marketing ever because you get a direct response from the people you are serving things to. And if the people you're serving things to in overwhelming numbers are saying this is garbage, why would you not listen? Why would you not tap into a group of these people and be like, hey, you know what? Let's bring in the super fans. What do you have for us? What do you think about this? Of course you would listen to people. That's why focus groups exist. And if you're trying to serve people who have been buying from these IPs and such for 30, 40 plus years, why would you not want to hear from those people what they want? We should have, I don't want to say a checks and balances system, but that's basically what it works out to. You should have 
the general moviegoer in a focus group, but you should also have the super fan. And people in a diverse and well put together focus group come from different walks of life and different levels of interest with the thing that they're engaging with so that we can figure out what works. Instead of trying to force feed us garbage and then blaming us when it doesn't work, they should have been listening. It's not a crime to listen to constructive criticism. Now, again, if what they were listening to was vitriol and prejudice, then that should really be ignored because that's not valid criticism. But things like, I think the Acolyte was poorly scripted, the dialogue sucked, I think the Marvels was not a good Marvel movie. I mean, really, I find it kind of hilarious how initially fans were the people that got listened to, and then they became the people to villainize. And now shareholders and everybody involved is like, oh my God, we're not making any money. We better ask these people what the f they wanna see before we publish this. And maybe that's the best way to avoid putting out a show that costs $230 million and gets minimal viewing on your own streaming service. Maybe listening to the fans, fans, not toxic fandom as Variety and other people have tried to label these folks, maybe listening to them is the way to go. And that's all from me. I've been Snarky J. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. For more Snarky J, be sure to check me out on Instagram. And if you'd like to support me, this channel, and my content creation, do check out and consider subscribing to my Patreon for exclusive photo shoot sets and cosplay content. I will add links to all of those in the description below. And let me know your thoughts on toxic fandom in the comments below.